Hello everyone and thank you once again for joining us on our YouTube channel, The Biblical Perspective. Um, today we're continuing our study on the book of Isaiah, um, on our quarter of studies going through this book. Um, the title for this quarter of studies that we're currently doing is um, Comfort My People. So I'm glad you're able to join us again um, as we continue to study this book. Don't forget to like, um, comment and subscribe. We actually upload a video every Saturday for you to help you in your journey in regards to learning more about God's Word and to learn about um, how to study God's Word and to know more in regards to what God is saying to you. So thank you for joining us and um, I hope that you enjoy the study that we have today. So we're actually on study um, number five um, of our 13 week study and um, today we'll be looking at um, Noble Prince of Peace. You're with myself Colleen and with um, with Pedro. Before we go any further um, in this study um, I'll just like to start um, with a word of prayer. Pedro could you pray for us please? Let us pray. Father in heaven we just ask for wisdom, intelligence and understanding and desire to apply your word in our lives as you reveal it to us in Jesus name. Amen. Amen. So Pedro, we're continuing on our, um, our study in the book of Isaiah and um, last week, the week before we looked at 7, Isaiah 7, we, we looked at Isaiah, um, last week we looked, we, last week we actually looked at um, Isaiah 7, continued Isaiah 7 and looked at a bit of um, Isaiah 8 and this week I'm going to start off by um, looking at um, Isaiah 9. So we're slowly trying to, um, to make our way through through the book on this study of the, the book of Isaiah. Um, last week we looked at quite um, a popular text that um, you see quoted a lot and referred to and I wanted to, to have a look at another text as well that's that, that we're all familiar with um, and again look at the context in which we actually find this text and what that text actually meant to the people at the time as well as what we actually understand that text to mean to us um, today. So I wanted to actually start by reading um, um, Isaiah 9 verse 6 and 7 so I'll be reading from the, um, the New International Version Isaiah 9 verse 6 and 7 and it says for to us a child is born to us a son is given and the government will be on his shoulders and he will be called wonderful counselor mighty God everlasting father prince of peace of the increase of his government and peace and peace there will be no end he will reign on david's throne and and over his kingdom establishing and upholding it with justice and righteousness from the time from that time on and forever the zeal of the lord almighty will accomplish this so the title for this week's lesson is called um, Noble Prince of Peace and I was thinking about this, the, the, the whole idea of peace and um, I was reading and it was saying that, um, that um, this whole idea of peace is actually, um, it's like elusive to the human race and when I was reading um, I read something where it says that for, for every year of war there's been um, two, two minutes, is it two minutes? Two minutes of peace. Um, so I just wanted to relate that text in relation to our title this week and looking at it in the context of the book of Isaiah and the people at that time for our study today. Okay, so I, I agree that this is the text that you've just read, Isaiah 9 verses 7 and 8, um, 6, 6 and, and 7. 7 yes is is a very well-known text particularly within the gospel mm. uh, tradition because this is a text again that is applied to Jesus Jesus Christ the the, the savior of of the world but this text comes as you, you suspect it we saw last mm. in our last study that there there is a, a historical context mm. To what Isaiah is saying and it must have something to do with the time and the moment 
in spite of maybe its double application yes. or meaning, it has to have an impact on the primary audience. Mm -hmm. And again, you will notice that this text that you read starts with a child is born unto us. So when was the last time we saw the, the birth of a child? It was in seven yes. and in eight. Yes, one was called Emmanuel, the yes. other one was called Maher Shalalash Baz. <laughs> and both of them were signs mm. as to what God was going to do within the context mm. of Israel yes. at the, I mean uh, when I say Israel Judah, uh, Judah yes. at the time the word was spoken mm -hmm. and I believe that here although we see a greater or an increase in the prophetic dimension the messianic prophetic dimension of the text it still has something to do with the current situation. Mm. Let us remember, we can't separate chapter 7, 8, yeah. 9, 10, 11. We can't yeah. separate no. them. Let us remember that from the beginning of the book of Isaiah to the end of it, mm. the main issue is God's dealing mm. with his people's problem which is rebellion. Yeah. For instance, to explain the relevance of this text that you've just read, Isaiah 9, 6 and 7, mm -hmm. let us go back to chapter 8, verse 15, for instance. Um, chapter 8, verse 15. Shall I read that? Yeah, you can read that. It says, chapter 8, 15, I'm reading from the New International Version. It says, many of them will stumble, they will fall and be broken, they will be snared and captured. Is that good news? No, it's bad news. Okay. <laughs> so, this is the chapter that spoke about a child also. Mm. And I don't remember if we actually identified um, this part of the text in terms of who he, uh, it is addressing but here um, God is speaking to Isaiah about the situation of the people yeah and he is saying uh, that's in the 8th century BC he is saying this is what's going to happen to them and we do know if we read for instance uh, first Kings uh, sorry, 2 Kings uh, 15, 16, and, and even 17, that the, the particularly 16, I think, um, how the people of Judah were really ill-treated by their brothers in association with the Syrians, which you find in chapter 8 as the confederacy that they're talking about. Remember in our last yes. study. Mm -hmm. Now, if you read um, verse 18, sorry, verse 19 and 20 of chapter 8, still. 19 and 20. 19 and 20. I actually wanted to touch on this when we did it, but I didn't have the time. Um, Isaiah 8, 19 and 20, and it says, when men tell you to consult mediums and spirits who whisper and mutter, should not a people inquire of their God? Uh -huh. Why consult the dead on behalf of the living? Mm -hmm. To the law and to the testimony, if, if they do not speak according to this word, they have no light of dawn. So God is speaking to Isaiah. We mm -hmm. did touch on this in our last study. And he's telling Isaiah, look, this is the situation of the people. We heard about Ahaz and his bad decision, but we're hearing about the people and the state that in which in. they are. To the point that they would want Isaiah to go and commune or 
not necessarily Isaiah, but they would want to commune with dead people, mm. inquire of dead people when God comes with a message for them and they don't want to hear. So that's the situation of the people. We're still trying to shed light on chapter 9, 6 and 7, which you read. Now, let's go to chapter 9 and let's read from verse 13 to 16. 13 to 16. Yeah, chapter 9, 13 to 16. Okay, chapter 9, 13 to 16, reading from the New International Version. But the people have not returned to him who struck them, nor have they sought the Lord Almighty. So the Lord will cut off from Israel both head and tail, both palm, branch and reed in a single day. The elders and prominent men are the head, the prophets who teach lies are the tail. Again, highlighted here, and this is consistent from chapter 1 until chapter 9 where we are at now. God is dealing with the rebellious attitude, mm. the wickedness, the evilness of a people who is called by his name. That's Judah. And he's saying the prophets, the priest, the king, everybody is involved yeah. in this. You remember, we read from 2 Chronicles 27, verse 2, when Uzziah died, his son mm -hmm. became king, Jotham. Jotham was a good king, mm -hmm. and he sought the Lord. But the people, mm -hmm. the princes, mm -hmm. the judges, yeah they were doing ever more wickedly. This is the situation. And that is consistent throughout the book of Isaiah. From chapter 1 to the last chapter. It would be a grave mistake not to highlight this sufficiently because we would do away with the essence of the book. Now, let's go back to the text which you read, which is before the verses you've just read in chapter 9. And I think it is important that we do this because I think that often when we speak of the book of Isaiah and when people quote the book of Isaiah, it's always the... The good stuff. The good stuff. It's always the... the there's no context to to where that good stuff is coming from like it's just in relation to the like the nice texts and we take those and we don't really understand that much more about the context and the history of the book by doing this we are just defeating the purpose of the book mm -hmm. now the two verses that you have read come before the last which We've just read about the situation of the people, mm. even when God would strike them mm. using um, surrounding nations, they would not return. Mm. And they would go and commune and force people to do the evil things to the point that in the last part of chapter 8, um, God is telling Isaiah, look, you need to be faithful. Don't worry about what these people are doing, which we saw yeah. in, in, yeah. in our last study. Now, coming back to verses 6, six and, seven. and 7, what we see is the solution mm -hmm. that God wants to bring to that state mm -hmm. of darkness in which the people is. I'd like you to read verses um, 4 to 7. You've, you've, read, you've read 6 and 7, but can you start? Can you read just 4 and 5? 4 and 5. Please. Um, Isaiah 9, verse 4, it mm -hmm. says, For as in the day of Median defeat, you have, you have shattered the yoke the yoke 
that burdens them, the bar across their shoulder, the rods of their oppressors, every warrior boot used in battle and every garment rolled in blood will be disdained for burning, will be fueled for the fire. Uh-huh. And then you, you, you read, for unto us a child is born and so on and so forth. Yeah? Yes. In the middle of God's dealing with a rebellious, a consistently rebellious, evil people who would not turn to him at any time, who would not hear his voice at any time, who would choose to go after other gods all the time, and who would not in any way uphold righteousness God is saying I will bring a change Mm. and that change will come under the form of a new government thus using the imagery of the present situation of these people being ill-governed by Ahaz and his like. You with me? He brings the idea of a new government, one who will be light in the midst of darkness, one that will bring a reverse of the situation of wickedness and evilness through righteousness. What is the impact of this in the middle of this crisis? Hope. Hope for Isaiah to know that even though the situation is what it is and God has allowed retribution to take place, he is going to change things at an appointed time. And he will not do it just somewhere in a corner. He will do it at a grand scale. He will bring a child, the imagery of the child again, And this child will be what nobody else Mm -hmm. can be. So the message brings hope Mm -hmm. into this very situation. How it is um, fulfilled, this is a different story. Isaiah will not see that. Mm -hmm. Some people believe that this child might be Hezekiah mm-hmm. who came after um, Ahaz but it can't be given the task that this child mm-hmm. is going to, to take upon himself yeah. God is just telling his people of then and of all times that darkness if you read the beginning of chapter 9 it's about darkness and people seeing a great light. Mm. He's just telling his people that the situation of darkness, mm. which did not start with Israel, but right after the fall in Genesis 3, the situation of wickedness in which Israel and other people on this earth find themselves he is going to resolve this but he's going to do it in a particular way he's going to do it through the coming of one who will be the king of righteousness the king of kings the prince of peace now we know that he is told he Right there, he was talking about Christ himself. 
So it has an application for us, mm -hmm. but for all times, even within the context of Isaiah's oh, situation, yes. it gives hope. Mm -hmm. Are you with me? Yes. So the book of Isaiah goes in and out. Mm -hmm. You need to be following mm -hmm. the story. God may speak um, a word that is to be applied straight away, but he may speak a word also mm -hmm. that may need to take time mm -hmm. to be fulfilled. Yes. And he may speak a word that does both. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's applicable now mm -hmm. and it will be applicable in the future. This is what we have right here. And he does this throughout the book of Isaiah as well. Yeah. Why? Because the book of Isaiah, once again, is dealing with a problem that is not specific to the people around Isaiah, yeah. but to the condition mm. of the world. Yeah, yeah. Because it's speaking about the, the condition of God's people in all generations. Right? Absolutely. Yeah. Um, just to go on, just to like, just to add to the point that you made, because we've discussed already about the fact that the book of Isaiah is kind of like focused on a central theme, and that central theme is about the darkness and the rebellion and the wickedness of God's people. And we see that again here in Isaiah 10. If I can just quickly read Isaiah 10, mm -hmm. verse 1 and 4, and it says, Woe to those who make unjust laws to those who issue oppressive decrees to deprive the poor of their rights and withhold justice from from the up from the oppressed of my people making widow widows their their prey and robbing the fatherless what will you do on the day of reckoning when disaster comes from afar to whom will you run for help where will you leave your riches? Nothing will remain but to cringe among the captive or fall among the slain. So we read that, but what I wanted to ask you about mm -hmm. was um, we see this idea of a remnant. Yeah. And we read that in Isaiah, um, co continuing on Isaiah 10, um, verse 20. And it says, in that day, the remnant of Israel, the survivors of the house of Jacob, will no longer rely on him who struck them down, but will truly rely on the Lord, the Holy One of Israel. So we, con we continually see this whole idea of God's of rebellion. And we've discussed um, in regards to almost God's solution to that. Um, but what about this, this whole idea about the remnant of Israel? Look, let me go back to something. I, I said a few minutes ago that God used, when he's talking about this child who will become um, a king who will reign with righteousness and so on, he is using the imagery that is existent at the time. If you read the story of Ahaz mm. uh, in 2 Chronicles 28, he is a wicked king. No, no two ways yeah, about that. So God is using the current situation of the, the current kingship to show what his kingship, the kingship he wants to establish, mm. will be like in contrast to what is, is, is happening now. This is being done throughout the book. The, the question of the remnant, it's not the first time we hear it. No, you remember not. when we read chapter 1. From Isaiah 1, yes. And, and I believe around verses 9, 10, 11, um, he says, um, if God had not left a remnant, we would have been like Sodom and Gomorrah. Yes. You're with me. Mm -hmm. Again, to emphasize that, and then in our last study, I spoke about how God is dealing with the bigger picture. The two kings, 
who wanted to attack Ahaz, their objective was to replace mm. him. Yes. But God was preserving the line for this child in chapter 9. Mm -hmm. So the kings did not succeed, although they inflicted great pain mm -hmm. to Ahaz and the people, they did not succeed in their plan, which was to take Ahaz down mm -hmm. and put somebody else in place. So within the story, the historical element of the text, God is working for both the now and the then. So the, the, the remnant theme will always be there. Why? Because this king has to reign over a kingdom has to reign over a people. Who is this people? Throughout the book of Isaiah, again, it is those, like Isaiah himself in chapter 8, who will listen to God's word and do His will. In spite of the environment yes. around them. Yes. So the idea of a remnant that's why the people did not end up like Sodom and Gomorrah, because yes. of this king yes. who must come and who must reign over a kingdom. Mm -hmm. So do you see how consistent yes. the message is? But it comes heavily with a depiction of the situation of God's people. And it's going back to this whole idea about this remnant where it talks about um, um, when God said to Isaiah, um, do not fear what they fear. Um, in chapter 8, yeah. yeah. In chapter 8, it says, um, do not fear what, it says, do not fear what they fear and do not, and do not dread it. This is um, Isaiah, um, Isaiah 8, 13, if, if, 12 and 13. If you look at um, verse 18 of chapter 8, Isaiah is here uh, a, a type of this remnant. Mm -hmm. In verse 18 he says, Behold, I and the children whom the Lord hath given me are for signs and for wonders in Israel from the Lord of hosts which dwelleth in Mount Zion. He is a type of that remnant. Yes. That's why I used in and out, in and out. God speaks to the historical situation, but he also speaks to the future mm -hmm. events. And the line includes beginning mm -hmm. and end. And end. Mm -hmm. So I think it's... Um, I think it's important to recognize this this kind of like characteristic of Isaiah in order to um, understand in order to understand it when you are um, going through the different chapters. It, it's it's essential. Otherwise, it doesn't make sense very often. Mm. So you need to recognize that this is what Isaiah is doing, mm -hmm. and go along with him. Resist the idea of only looking at the good parts yes. where you have all the feel not, all the comfort. Mm -hmm. You would not have that if you didn't have the main part, yes. which is wickedness mm -hmm. and evil and rebellion is prevalent mm -hmm. in the situation. Okay. Well, thank you for um, the study today. And um, thank you for joining us. Um, I hope you gain some insight into, into the book of Isaiah. And I'd like to encourage you to join us next week where we will continue this study. So thank you for um, studying with us today.